my name is uh, George Tatar from the Budapest Center for Dialogue and Mass Atrocities, uh, mass atrocities Prevention. <clears throat> uh, just one year ago, we launched our series of webinars. And unfortunately, during this last year, the adverse trends have survived in the world affairs to the record of the year 2022, which witnessed the greatest number of the most intense and longest lasting armed conflicts and wars in the world since the end of the Second World War. In 2023, we observed the lineup of the war and tragedies in Gaza last October with implications of risks of genocide and other mass atrocities and further escalation of the conflict. When forcing the trends of 2024, uh, we may not be optimistic either. There is a growing risk of use of force to settle problems. There is a growing risk of use of nuclear weapons with a devastating result uh, for the humankind. There is a growing risk of sharpening the rivalry between global players. There is a growing risk of advancement of populism and nationalism, which as we know, rely mainly on hatred and enmity. Moreover, we know that during 2024, almost half of the population of the world, globally more voters than ever in history, will go to the polls. The election campaigns uh, will take place in 64 countries, plus the elections of the European Parliament will take, take place, which will definitely divide populations, increase polarization, tensions and hostilities, and definitely will generate conflict situations across identities and values. Regret regrettably, in 2023, dialogue continued to play an insufficient role in contributing to peace and reconciliation, improving uh, better understanding and in exploring the objective course of conflicts and in transforming hostile situations into peaceful human relations. We may state that the year of 2023 was one more year of missed opportunities from the perspective of dialogue. The adverse trends and upcoming threats, however, may not deter us from promoting the concept and practice of dialogue. To the contrary, we, we must feel encouraged to continue our efforts to also enhance the community of dialogue practitioners and promote institutionalization of dialogue at both multilateral and national levels. Just to give you some tangible examples, even if the conflicts in Gaza and Ukraine threatening, unfortunately, with escalation for the time being, but they will be finished, and let us hope that will happen soon. There will be an enormous number of tasks and challenges for the dialogue community. We shall need to help in reconciliation, restoring and improving human relationships. And that must be done, not only between the conflict parties, but also at regional and even global levels. So therefore, we are resolute to continue our efforts to establish the Alliance for Dialogue, and we shall relentlessly continue our advocacy efforts to integrate dialogue in the decision-making mechanisms and education. We do believe that dialogue should become a consistently used element of the toolkit for security, stability, and peace. In that spirit, we continue our series of webinars and hope to finish the reflection process, which we launched one year ago, to finalize our statement for both the establishment of the Alliance for Dialogue and the institutionalization of dialogue. And let me encourage you to make further inputs. I would like to invite all of you who participate in our event today and those who will watch the record of our event later on, please feel free to contact me bilaterally if you feel the need to consult with me. As to our webinar today, uh, we shall focus on views and experience in dialogue from the perspective of governments. We have succeeded to organize a panel of high-level governmental officials who will share their experience gained in the past and their views and expectations on how dialogue would contribute to enhancing peaceful human relations across cultures. But before we start the panel, it's a privilege for me for us to welcome in our circle uh, Ambassador Guillerme, uh, the chair of the Global Action 
uh, against mass atrocity crimes, who took up this responsible and challenging position last November. Let me wish him also on your behalf successful chairmanship, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador has been a career diplomat in the Costa Rican Foreign Service since 1998, and uh, from April 2020 to June 2023, he was Deputy Minister of Multilateral Affairs. He worked as ambassador and deputy permanent representative at the permanent mission of Costa Rica to the UN in New York in 1920, uh, 90, 2019 and 2020. Uh, he was the deputy permanent representative uh, uh, of Costa Rica to the United Nations in Geneva uh, and also deputy permanent rep uh, and political coordinator during Costa Rica's membership in the Security Council at the permanent mission of Costa Rica to the United Nations in New York in 28 and 29. Um, uh, he was Director General of Foreign Policy after working with the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva and also in Santiago, uh, Chile as uh, Regional Representative of the High Commissioner. Uh, he was the Chair Rapporteur of the UN Open-Ended Working Group on the Right to Peace. Uh, between 1993 to 1998, uh, the ambassador, uh, Guy Hermet, uh, was an official in the office of the Ombudsman of Costa Rica, and uh, he was also at the beginning of the creation of the institution. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, I am happy that uh, we can, uh, we can uh, welcome you in our circle, and please take the floor and share your thoughts uh, with us. The floor is yours. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be uh, here today. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everybody. Uh, hello from, from a very cold Geneva, but with a very big heart to be part of, of this group. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, George, uh, dialogue, dialogue and dialogue. This is what we need more and more. And even that we had a very difficult year and the things now are not doing very well all around the world, we need to continue to be optimistic. We cannot cross our arms. We need to continue to have hope because if you don't have hope and you are not optimistic, it's impossible to work on prevention. And uh, this is for me fundamental as a, as a, as a, as a first say in, 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 in this opportunity. But uh, let me talk a little bit about what is GAMAC and how we I think that this uh, platform is a platform that can have a lot of results uh, on the prevention of mass atrocities. For sure, you can say what is happening in Gaza, what is happening in Ukraine, in Crimea, Nagorno-Karabakh, what is happening in Yemen, in Yemen and, and in the Middle East, uh, can bring us to a feeling that we fail. But it's very difficult to have results when you do a good job in prevention. Because when you, the only way that you know that the, the, we fail is when you have uh, uh, crimes, atrocity crimes or uh, indicious of genocide. That's why the, the, the measure of how we are uh, doing on prevention is very difficult. But with, from GAMAC, I have some examples that I want to share with you how we are doing and how we are doing well. Uh, my, as I said, it's a real pleasure. To, to be with all of you as a chair, a global chair of the, the platform of action against mass atrocity crimes. And I wanted, first of all, to thank you, the Budapest Center for Mass Atrocity Prevention, Cultures and Charity and Nascent Scholing for convening this event. And I would like personally thank uh, you, George, for and your team to provide me us with the opportunity to deliver a keynote opening today's event. And this event uh, raised a key point on how we can support multilateral institution efforts towards mass atrocity prevention. And in this regard, uh, I'm very pleased to showcase 
one example of networks composed of states and civil society towards the strengthening of national resilience to atrocity crimes, and more specifically, I'm referring to GAMAC, and how, as in this platform, we can support multilateral efforts towards an upfront and permanent atrocity prevention agenda. As you may know, GAMAC is a state political initiative composed by states, civil society, and academia uh, that seeks to promote the establishment of national architectures and policies for the prevention of atrocity crimes. It, it was uh, um, created in 2013, and since then, uh, our platform has grown into a well-respected Converter, which enables uh, its diverse worldwide uh, constituency to engage in frank and often difficult discussions about sensitive topics. It's always very difficult to talk about mass atrocities and genocide. Actually, the GAMAC is composed by 13 uh, steering group members from states, uh, civil society organizations and academia, uh, on, on the side of the states, we have Argentina, Costa Rica, my own country, Denmark, Ghana, Switzerland, and Tanzania. And together with other steering committee uh, group members, they set the policy of our network. It means the, 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 the GAMAC is a platform, it's a network. Uh, and, and in this year, for instance, we are embark ourselves in uh, mapping strategies and priorities for upcoming uh, um, uh, strategic vision for 2025-2027. And, uh, and sometimes in, in when I took over this chairmanship, I say to my colleagues, wow, it's going to be very difficult because the times are very challenging. But as I said, we we need to continue to work. We need to have hope and, and to be optimistic. And, and uh, finally, also think out of the box to find solutions and other ways to reach our world goal. The other thing from GAMAC, which is I want to, to stress, and for me it's very important, is that, is that in, we have also informal alliances and, and community members that support the implementation of our common strategic vision. Um, GAMAC has, for, for instance, not only state members, but also state partners, Armenia, Chile, Netherlands, and Slovenia as well as 25 civil society organizations, partners from the Americas, from Africa, Asia, and international CSO focusing on the MENA region, which is one of the more hot spots actually. GATMARC uh, maintains informal alliances also to concretize our work with the International Holocaust uh, Remembrance Alliance, uh, INRA, with the OSCE, Office of for Democratic uh, Institutions and Human Rights, and for short sure with UNESCO. And in, in the end of uh, the last November 2023, we strained our alliance uh, with INRA by becoming a permanent international partner. Uh, we continue to bring more people around this platform. And one of the, my goals and objectives as, a, as a, I'm the first chair who is based in Geneva is also to make well known what the, the work of GAMAC and also to bring more uh, 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 countries on board, also to give us a certain sustainability to this uh, platform. Uh, and also because we need to continue to do more work on education, on sharing uh, 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 best practices. And for us, it's very important that we have a full support of all countries. And GAMAC uh, has been keen on bringing together uh, multiple and, di and diverse uh, actors from different backgrounds, uh, gender, geographical regions, and areas of involvement uh, ranging from remembrance from education, genocide prevention, responsibility to protect human rights and humanitarian action, peace building, justice and development. Which is mean we are trying to touch all the range of the work of the of, and, and the multilaterals. And also we have increased uh, our efforts in recent years, not only 
to expand the number of states uh, and organizations joining the, the network, but also strengthen relations and cooperation with partners and influences, which for us is, is fundamental. More and more, we have people coming from outside of uh, the, the governments, outside of the academia, but also those informal networks are very useful for our work and we can have a better synergies because we have a lot of people doing the same thing, but we don't, we are not looking for the synergies among, uh, among us. That's why the efforts to bring together as many diverse stakeholders as possible derive from our funding document uh, adopted in 2013, which uh, highlight the prevention of, of atrocities requires a holistic approach that encompasses multiple and interdisciplinary efforts in many areas. That's why Gamat is also convinced that prevention requires knowledge of the root causes of violence, as well as learning to recognize vectors of violence and signals of uh, potential mass atrocity before they, they occur. It means we need early warning signals and, and mechanisms to avoid, because now it is well known that genocide and mass atrocity crimes do not happen overnight, but they are often a result of a long process, unfortunately. It's what we are seeing in the, in the, in, in nowadays. But now, how does state lead the platform work? How do we concretize our impact? Look, in order to build a, a momentum, we convene global meetings, and as they are crucial to allow the exchange of reflections and best practices between all those involved in prevention activities, including, of course, uh, among members of its community, regional initiatives, and working groups. Um, we have held four of these biennial global meetings since 2011, and these four global meetings have each convened more than 200 participants from over 50 states, as well as international and regional organizations and civil society. And the participants have shared lessons learned, good practices, and learning between different fields of prevention and have launched our regional initiatives, which is, I think, the, the, the most powerful tool that we have now in GAMAC is exactly the result of these working groups, uh, regional working groups. The global meetings, as I say, are playing a significant role in providing guidance principles for national initiatives and policies. And in order to support uh, uh, the implementation and follow-up of, of the recommendations proposed at the global meetings toward the end of goal of promoting prevention at the national level, because this is our, is, this is, must be our constant and objective constant goal is to create this uh, national mechanism. Um, um, we are from, uh, 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 is, 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 is our endeavor of GAMAC to do so. And, uh, and that's why we move from a global uh, vision to have regional visions, because the, 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 the way that we can have and the, what the different communities have uh, uh, yeah. suffered bring other possibilities for, for others to uh, uh, make their own mechanism with their own reality on, on prevention. And uh, that's why they, they are, we have uh, undertaken some uh, various uh, um, initiatives uh, from countries and regions uh, who join efforts to make a specific and, as I said, concrete contributions to atrocity prevention at the national level. Two of these uh, initiatives have evolved into regional working groups which are, this is really a fantastic product of our 
uh, uh, gamma platform, namely in, in Africa, in Asia Pacific, and, and let me elaborate a little bit uh, uh, on the work of these initiatives and working group by highlighting some of their activity last year. For instance, the, the African group is a female lead uh, and benefits from the participation of key female leaders, foreign, uh, foreign uh, affairs, uh, the former foreign affairs minister of Tanzania, Ambassador Liberata Mula Mula is the patron of the African Working Group. She is doing a fantastic, fantastic work. And Justice Jamila Mohammed from Kenya chairs uh, is now the, the currently. And the African uh, Working Group is composed of 35 uh, members. Uh, and the last year highlight event was the very first regional forum in Abidjan from, in September last year, organized with the support of GAMAC. And this is, uh, it was a, a, something very new in this region. And the results and the discussion that we have there were very, very, very uh, rich. And I think that the, the, the more than 15 person participants attend each day. And the forum provide a space of dialogue and exchange of good practices and lesson learned and benefit from the expertise and experience of various ministers of the Cote d'Ivoire government, members of the Assembly and Senate and civil society. And we had the opportunity also to have speakers coming from eight countries of four sub regions, Benin, Cote d'Ivoire, Central African Republic, Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, and Tanzania, representing governments, international organizations, national institution, academia, and civil society. As you say, it's a huge range of stakeholders that were there uh, expressing and exchanging the good practices and the, the, what they learned from the, the, the experience that they have at the national level. Among other activities that we have, uh, uh, the Asia Pacific Working Group, which is composed of 24 members that organize a hybrid dissemination workshop on his report, Preventing Hate Speech, Incitement and Discrimination Lessons on Promoting Tolerance and Respect for Diversity in the Asia Pacific. In Dhaka, Bangladesh, the report consists in six case uh, uh, studies uh, in the Philippines and Mindanao, Indonesia, Malaysia, India, Myanmar, and Pakistan, we were presented uh, by the respective authors. And the workshop was hosted by the Liberation War Museum, a Gamma Steering Committee member, and it was attended for more than 33 participants and include uh, Bangladesh uh, government officials. The other uh, field that we are working is on the thematic initiative. And we are organized three online events last year. The implementing partner for these events was the Inter-American Institute for Human Rights, uh, based in, in San Jose, Costa Rica. And the overall objective of these activities was to foster the understanding of the nexus between the violation of human rights, human rights laws, and hate of speech as a precursor of uh, atrocity crimes. And um, in, in October, this America's Regional Initiative organized an event in Colombia, where Gamma Partner Corporation, Corporación Humanas Colombia convened the event with the support of uh, our platform and Avocas Sans Frontier from Canada and USAID, and consisting a dialogue and exchange of human uh, of uh, exchange of good practices regarding the prevention of sexual and gender bias uh, based violence in the context of atrocity crimes. Let me say what is uh, want to, to end my intervention is to invite all of you to have a look in a website and where you can find detailed um, overviews of the work and composition of these groups and their activities. And as a conclusion, Georgie, uh, you can see how a network providing a, an horizontal exchange of view between states and civil society can really foster atrocity prevention efforts. And in this regard, uh, GAMAC, has been mentioned as a best practice and recognized as a key partner for prevention, and I'm really convinced about that. For example, the United Nations Secretary General's 
2019 report on the responsibility to protect lessons learned for prevention highlight the importance of putting prevention on front and the contribution of GAMA as an important platform for international cooperation in advancing national prevention efforts. And most recently, in 2023, uh, Secretary General reports on the responsibility to protect against highlights the GAMA Africa Working Group training tool, uh, toolkit which establishes and managing national mechanisms for mass atrocity prevention as an example of developing prevention capacity at the national level. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm very pleased to be part of this invitation. And I hope that uh, this GAMMA platform can also bring you some ideas and bring also, you can also be seduced to be part of this uh, uh, informal platform and you can find also uh, ways to think out of the box and give me some ideas and some support also in this very difficult endeavor that we have from GAP. But we, as I said, with a lot of optimism and hope that we can continue to work on uh, to fight uh, mass atrocities and genocide. Thank you very much. Uh, to all of you for your passions and and and, uh, and your kindness to receive me today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Gilm. It, it was a, an excellent uh, uh, presentation of your activities and uh, also the contribution of your organization uh, to the to the world world peace and uh, and security. And uh, I just want to warn you that. Um, we shall we shall uh, overload you with with our requests uh, how we you could use dialogue in your activities uh, how to include it incorporate it in in your in your activities and uh, also how to advocate uh, for this because i do think so together with the the, the co-organizers of the event that uh, this network is a huge one uh, the people who are there are really are dedicated to the issues of also of dialogue. They do understand what is the significance of dialogue from the perspective of different ethnicities, different identities. And I think so that uh, this is an asset what we shall have to use, not misuse, but use uh, for 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 our uh, common common cause. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask uh, the audience uh, right now whether does anyone uh, to ask something uh, to pose any question uh, to to uh, Mr. Ambassador uh, uh, with regard to to his, that activity is also maybe in the context uh, of dialogue. Probably then later on, uh, and then thank you very much once again, uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for your uh, for your uh, uh, keynote speech, um, and let us then uh, move to the to the to our panel uh, in the in the in our uh, in our uh, um, uh, webinar, and uh, the first the first panelist um, will be uh, Mila uh, Mila Popovic, uh, who is uh, the Director General. Uh, for interculturalism in the Ministry of Human and Minority Rights in Montenegro. And uh, she is, uh, uh, beyond that, the founder of Evolving Leadership. This is a program and consultancy for organizational development, transformational, uh, transformational leadership, and future readiness. She is on boards of numerous global organizations, steering new paradigm of human development. And let me just mention some of them. Uh, she is a fellow and a trustee of the World Academy of Art and Science. Um, she has uh, served there as chair of the partnership committee and also was head of the research, uh, uh, which, was, uh, which also was in charge of a joint project by the United Nations office at Geneva. Uh, she is a member of the board of directors of the World University Consortium. She is a member of the executive team of the Future Capital Initiative, which was co-founded by the UN Office for Partnerships, UNCTAD, and the World Academy of Art and Science. Mila is also a member of the Millennium Project, which is a global, global future think tank represented in 71 countries, and this, she's the co-chair of its Montenegro node. She's also a member of the Mastermind Group at the Da Vinci Institute in Colorado, 
She is a global member of Prototypia Labs and a global collaborator at the Global Education, Fut uh, Education Futures. Sorry for my pronunciation. Uh, uh, she serves also on board uh, of uh, uh, modern technology developing companies in South Korea. She is a fellow of Vital Voices. This is a global woman or women leaderships and an associate expert on ethics and gender issues at the European Commission. Um, last but not least, let me mention that she is an expert on the Gender Equality Impact Panel of the Caterva Award, and uh, this is the so-called Nobel Prize in Sustainability. But right now, I wanted to ask uh, and invite her to um, to. Uh, present her activities to present your views, Mila, with regard uh, to dialogue, with regard to the ethnic, eth ethnicity issues and all the activities what you do have uh, in, in, in Montenegro. Mila, the floor is yours. Please don't forget, you don't have more than 15 minutes, so time is rather uh, uh, tight. Thank you very much. Mila, the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much, uh, Georgia. This is um, an incredible opportunity to be with you and to show up in the public space together. I think that is the key of what needs to happen globally, to gather and to show up and stand up for certain values and values-based initiatives that should guide the new paradigm of human development. We certainly know that we are at the grand intersection where we are deciding on the course of that global and collective, as well as communal and individual development from here on. And what we need in that process is obvious to all of us. We need a new social agreement that would guide that process. And I think exactly the, the initiative, the Alliance for Dialogue, is one of the pathways and probably a key pathway that is proposing a certain approach that connects us and convenes us in in, in more noble and values-based way uh, to go forward because the world needs a new story. And the only way we can um, design it together and subscribe to it is by designing it through dialogue, through understanding universal uh, human needs as well as universal human aspirations. So in that sense, I'll share um, some information about the initiatives that was started here in Montenegro and paint a, a picture from a very um, volatile, um, very uh, fascinating intersection of East and West uh, where Montenegro is lo located and particularly Montenegro itself um, that is kind of a linchpin in the Balkans that stands the greatest opportunity to be the focalizer and the stabilizer exactly at the region that has exemplified something very negative in the world. And people have often used the term balkanization for other regions and other conflicts and other issues. And the time has come as I try to show through what we're doing here to rid ourselves of that kind of stigma and show that the greatest opportunities lie exactly at the most critical spaces and that they should be generated from the most critical spaces and regions because we know best what it's like to go through strife and conflict, to go through um, you know, civil wars that involve a, a mind boggling, not two, three sides, three, four, sometimes even five warring sides. So I'm just painting kind of a general picture of what is at stake and offering an example from this region in social innovation that is so profoundly needed and it's urgently needed. And it is in, in some sense um, sharing affinities and sharing principles and vision of what um, you are proposing through the Alliance for Dialogue. So to paint that larger picture, um, it is important to notice um, as you already know, um, but kind of create a, a drag, draft, a, 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 a sketch of where we're at collectively. On the one hand, we have a convergence of existential risks that are 
familiar to you, anywhere from conflict, poverty, pollution, climate change, migrations, you name it. On the other hand, we have the grand convergence already happening, the co-emergence and the grand convergence of technological advances. And they're not just artificial intelligence, but they're artificial intelligence at different levels and grades um, that are combining with uh, nanotechnology, synthetic biology, longevity studies, transhumanism, and you name it. All of these technologies and where we are at is at an impossible impasse that could become our passage into uh, up-leveling ourselves as human beings, evolving or becoming an, an absolutely destructive impasse. We are at a critical moment for human collective human decision of which direction we choose. And it could be that we are between Scylla and Charybdis. And the scientific curiosity innovation is never going to stop um, because we are built that way. That's part of our humanity. However, it is the ethical standards and the social norms and the vision for betterment that needs to be infusing those innovations to guide it properly. So everything right now hinges on social cohesion, on coming together, on building agreement and consensus and alliances and partnerships and, and global movements for ethical standards that would steer technology to solve our existential risks. And I think it's still possible. And as frightening as it might be to speak about artificial intelligence, again, we're at the beginning of it, but combined with other technologies, that's what's at stake. Um, and I'm glad to um, receive some questions later of what this convergence could be to clarify. But everything hinges on this new social agreement, on guidance with new ethical standards, on building consensus and going forward. The fascinating as far as you know, artificial intelligence and other technologies um, fact is that never before, the positive aspect of it, is that never before have we had a global collective discussion, debate, and conversation of this scale based on this kind of uh, threat and excitement and possibility. So that's something that we should value, that never before have you had um, Elon Musk, children in the street, Henry Kissinger, speaking of some political history, um, every country um, asking, what is this about? Where can it take us? What will happen to all of us? And as wonderfully Ambassador Guillerme uh, uh, spoke about the right to peace that I will back up uh, with all of my being and all of my work and all of my future striving, I will also mention something that I've been proposing and, and join it with that, couple it with that, is the right to future. Because right now we're deciding existentially what will take, what will happen to us. So what's needed is the new process of social learning. And with that new approaches, uh, we've tried different things. We've tried connectivity through social um, media and other facets, even through political channels. But what, ha what has happened increasingly that we have not experienced more human bonding more human agreement, more consensus. In fact, we have seen threats to democracy, threats to multilateralism, threats to essential social being um, through separations in COVID, through breakdowns in communications, through avatars and uh, virtual representatives, but not genuine, deep human bonding that is necessary to engender a new culture of intimacy that we need for new social direction. So with that, cultural dialogue, cultural diplomacy, intercultural dialogue are of vital importance. Painting this larger picture with you um, and for our audience today.
it is apparent that this is to be or not to be time. And there is no way to go forward, but to go together because we are social beings and it is impossible to survive as a human without the quality of life that we need. So what we realized in Montenegro and Montenegro um, kind of distinguishes itself in, in certain ways that it has always been a Highlanders mentality kind of country, mountainous region, um, very um, independence loving and freedom fighters by its sensibility and mentality. And for the first time in its history, when the former Yugoslavia fell apart and the civil wars um, broke out, for the first time, Montenegro did not want to participate in something like that, but in, instead chose to receive um, refugees from all four or five warring sides. And at one point, a tiny country of then 700,000 people, uh, an ancient country, um, but tiny country, um, received and had 25% of its populations were refugees who were all taken care of and most importantly, started living peacefully here. With the breakout of Ukrainian um, war um, and the conflict in Ukraine, in Ukraine, I should say, um, Russians, Ukrainians, and others have been flocking to Montenegro, receiving, all receiving help and support and all living peacefully here. So when we realized that, we thought that there is something here in its ethical code, in its welcoming approach that we should, so to speak, socio, um, so, socio-culturally capitalize on. And also realize that in the midst of civil wars in 1991, um, simply unheard of, Montenegro decided to pro proclaim itself constitutionally the first ecological state in the world. We have a long way to go, um, I'll be honest. But there's something about marking the map and marking, you know, putting that flag of high, you know, climbing the heights of such vision and staking the claims there. Um, I'm sure we have a lot to learn from Costa Rica. I know that already, but this is where we need each other. And the entire message is that we need each other and we belong to each other and all to the planet with which we are co-emergent and consciousness that we, in the spirit of that new process of social learning and intercultural dialogue, we need exchange of knowledge, experiences, best practices, goodwill, and ethical standards. So what we did, we realized that if we cannot compete in the global uh, market and in the current situation, technologically or militarily, nor should we uh, financially, but we certainly can offer something to the world as a model. Um, and that is the formation of Directorate for Interculturalism at the Ministry of Human and Minority Rights. And it was intentionally placed in the Ministry of Human Rights because if you take into consideration the existential risks, and the technological advances, what is at stake fundamentally are human rights. The rights to our own identity, personality, body, freedom, and all other um, aspects of basic human security. This is what is uh, at stake. So with the director of inter interculturalism, I'll be brief. Um, we are trying to build the culture of interbeing integral knowledge for internal and regional integra integration and offering a model to the world, um, especially with our aspirations to become member of the EU family, what it is that we can offer from our tough historical lessons and experiences to Europe that is now dealing with migrations and struggling, especially in the urban environment on how to harmonize the social field. So the culture of interbeing in the spirit of holistic approach is based on scientific and spiritual knowledge that all inter, all beings, all life forms, all phenomena 
are interconnected and mutually interdependent. Out of that comes a set of values, um, empathy, and others as foundational that need to be taught, that need to be promoted, that need to be invoked, uh, that everybody's well-being depends on everybody else's well-being in the greater web of life. So three key principles there that we uh, kind of distilled for, for easier dissemination is that we are focusing on peaceful coexistence, shared lives and conviviality, solidarity, and co-responsibility for shared futures. We have a tendency in this region, but I think even worldwide, to point fingers at each other, at other communities, and saying somebody else is always at fault. Uh, there is no getting out of shared responsibility for shared future. So I can, you know, we can continue discussing some of the ways we have approached this. The first and foremost, I can tell you, we started with youth and creating an event called Direct Intercultura Montenegro, which is all understandable to all of you, and branding the country as the land of interculture, because we are constitutionally multi-ethnic, multi-confessional, multicultural, but realizing now that multiculturalism is a fact. Every region is unavoidably multicultural, but sometimes that multiculturalism leaves us at a safe distance of tolerance and respect. But what we need is to advance tolerance and respect towards these three principles and develop a new model of living together and living uh, well, living well together. So we started with youth, with their creativity, with them sharing their stories, their concerns, their needs and aspirations, and at the same time going to the top level, to the top echelon of the cabinet, um, of the other, other ministries and trying to develop a national strategy. This is where I would love to recognize my um, and our Macedonian brothers and sisters who started thinking about this sometime in 2019 and um, developed a center, uh, as far as I know, for intercultural dialogue, admirable initiative. But director for interculturalism has been kind of a unique, both social and institutional innovation for that matter. And I will round this off um, with the conclusion that we realized that human rights, universal human rights, and universal humanistic values are the foundation for any sense of human security and the basis for actually achieving sustainable development. And that the new process of social learning will demonstrate that every aspect of so human security is needed to be achieved and it can be measured individually before it can be reached collectively through sustainable development goals. For that, we need interculturalism for multilateralism and peace. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mila. It was uh, very, uh, really global, interesting. And um, uh, I do have a lot of questions, but I cannot pose now. Uh, and also, I will not give the possibility to, to anybody uh, this time, but because I, we need to move forward. And uh, let me uh, give now the floor to uh, Mr. Robert Alagiuszowski, who is the National Coordinator for Interculturalism, One Society, Development of Culture and Interministerial Cooperation in the Government of the Republic of North Mas Macedonia. He is president of the coordination body for implementation of the national strategy for one society concept and interculturalism. And this is a, a, well, like a country pivotal strategy in the field of intercultural integration and also social uh, inclusion. He is a member of the uh, Council of Europe's Committee of Experts on Intercultural Inclusion. Um, he also participated in the in the intercultural intergovernmental agency program of the OSCE's High Commissioner for National Minorities, and he has developed close bilateral cooperation there. 
Actually, he was minister, minister of culture uh, in 2017 and 2018. He cared that time for adequate development of the intercultural section within the National Strategy on Culture, and that was one of his one of his duties. Uh, he also has been involved in intercultural integration, conflict prevention, dialogue, and diversity management for more than 20 years. Uh, the past achievements uh, included that he was uh, in in between 2003 and 7 NGO contrapunct project confluent margins uh, which is on cultural de decentralization and calming of interethnic tensions in the post uh, conflict uh, period uh, robert uh, i hope i i didn't miss uh, too much uh, so the the floor is yours please try to respect the 15 minutes maximum thank you very much Thank you. Thank you, Georgi. Thank you for inviting me uh, to be at this panel. And I want to thank uh, to all the uh, participants uh, for their presence and uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak. Of course, I congratulate uh, the previous uh, speakers for their great talks, which uh, were very inspirational. And then uh, on the other side, they also uh, afford me uh, to speak not to repeat, but to congratulate on all the stances that uh, uh, I share as a value and motivation for our uh, everyday work. So uh, you presented me uh, in, in a nutshell of everything important that uh, I have been doing. And uh, based on this practice, I would like to uh, focus on the topics that I believe you uh, find important and that you also would like to uh, hear our views. So uh, on this aspect, uh, you know, uh, uh, we are, I am a strong supporter, so you wouldn't uh, need to uh, convey me uh, or to persuade me why the institutionalization of dialogue is important uh, because, uh, well, uh, I would like to say that, uh, yes, we come from a, a region uh, which has a capacity or has experienced a capacity of conflict and atrocities on a different scale. But uh, as uh, you said in your introduction and, and the previous speakers, this uh, capacity for uh, hatred, for conflict, for atrocities is now becoming a, a global issue. So it's very important that we uh, are connected and that we share our experiences and our ethics because uh, it, it seems that uh, uh, this global world has uh, fractalized in a way in the concerns, and then it is showing uh, uh, negative capacities in interconnecting uh, uh, the, the the different uh, the different negative tendencies. So uh, North Macedonia is a small country; it's in the middle of the Balkans, and then there was a small city of it, Veles, but as even the global uh, media network reported, uh, this uh, small town uh, was uh, a machine in the fake news uh, production that also has some influence on the election in the United States. So you can imagine the scale of uh, uh, the interconnectedness of the role, but also it's not uh, of, of this extrapolation of this butterfly effect so that whatever we can think of in one part of the of the world it becomes uh, an importance on the other as well uh, in this aspect i have been steadily working in the last six or seven years in promotion of the intercultural dialogue so uh, it is a necessity of my own country to build its own internal consensus and cohesion. And in that aspect, we do have challenges uh, among the populations. We uh, used to uh, consider it's mainly uh, tensions uh, uh, among the ethnic communities, the ethnic identities, but now uh, we see another uh, conflict emerging, it's, uh, it's the gender violence is on the rise, but also the hate speech towards the vulnerable groups, towards the LBGTI, and 
even there is uh, a, there is a counter process of let's say uh, hate speech against religious freedom or religious practices. So it seems that uh, uh, the the issues which uh, which become uh, a target of, of of conflictual behavior and in a way uh, uh, a motors for for conflict is getting. Uh, uh, bigger and and uh, and and it, it is going in different issues, but the question which should concerns us and also the one who are sharing the intercultural and uh, and the dialogue oriented uh, attitude is that we are increasingly uh, identify ourselves in two camps. So on one side we have the so called progressive humanistic approach, and on the other side, as you have. Uh, uh, write it, uh, wrote it well, and you have wrote it well about all these issues in your articles that we have the opportunities to read, is that indeed we have the traditionalist uh, camp and then the progressivist camp, but uh, however, uh, uh, wanting to fight for our values and what we believe in, we are self-critically, if we are uh, about to confess, repeating the stereotypes, the prejudices, and then the conflictual behavior. And because of that, I think it's very important that uh, we care about the dialogue. And then this dialogue, we would often uh, like to say, and this is the case with our uh, intercultural strategy. Uh, it is the uh, dialogue uh, that we manage to, uh, to, to uh, let's say, uh, uh, incorporate and include the different parties, but mainly it's the dialogue of the people who are sharing the same values and attitudes. So we are very often facing the situation where when the so-called other camp is not included and they don't even want to participate, and then our efforts uh, sometimes do uh, have their own uh, internal blindness, not to have them uh, to co converse with, but to only think that uh, they are included while they actually are not. Having said that, uh, I am very much interested to, to hear and then to, uh, to uh, make international alliance, to have uh, experienced people who can uh, better uh, create an ambience of how to in include the eventual radically other whoever that might be presented in a certain in a certain issue. Uh, and then uh, the second view is concerning the institutionalization. Uh, I do think that political will is central, and I do believe that uh, even if you have instruments and institutions and obligation, uh, countries, governments, parties, power centers, they can still uh, refrain for, for uh, how to say, uh, exercising their duties. But yet, institutionalization convention, even laws or international uh, uh, agreements uh, can and are always more beneficial. So if we ask whether hard the law is better than the soft law, I believe that the hard uh, uh, law is always the best, better. And that's why institutions uh, are always better. Because if you have a political will, you don't even need them. But what to do in a cases of conflict in a cases of uh, big separation and division in the society and in the international scene and how to guarantee that a certain set of standards and rules are going to be implemented uh, regardless to whether there is a will, but they are obligatory because you also have a system of standards and a system of eventual, eventual uh, penalties or punishment, whatever that uh, might be. Uh, and having said that, I strongly support that the dialogue, which is much needed in this time, should be institutionalized and should be obligatory, better in a harder version than than not in a hard, than than in a in a in a softer in a looser way. This is also my experience uh, from the international uh, work that you mentioned, and uh, 
uh, it is very often that the national interests uh, can, uh, in a certain multilateral uh, ambience, uh, in a way, uh, put a shadow over, over the good intentions. And then if we are going for a compromise in an arena where there are so many different national uh, interests, at the end, the compromise wouldn't help the long-term stability, peace, and understanding that we all aspire for, but on the other side, uh, leave uh, uh, wrong feelings, leave uh, uh, feeling of defeat that can retroactively then make even bigger uh, damage than the initial consensus or the initial compromise that, uh, that was reached. So this is why I do believe that uh, a long-term institutionalized, uh, important, necessary, obligatory dialogue would make us to be on the same table uh, on a permanent scale, on a permanent level, and then of course uh, to, uh, to discuss and be able to discuss even with uh, the questions that uh, we are not uh, very much uh, willing to, to discuss. Uh, uh, but in order to do so, uh, my experience tells that we need to introduce uh, 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 an international forum, an international body that will, where everybody would be equally presented. If we quantify it or in other way uh, uh, introduce uh, the power disbalance in these bodies, then again, uh, we can have, uh, 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 coming out of that, we can have different uh, disbalances uh, uh, further emerging. So it's very important that people who are, or uh, communities or sites, however we call them, are invited into a multilateral dialogue, that they should all feel that they are here to express themselves and, and to talk. Because any imposition, any disbalance in power, it will uh, further produce the, the, uh, uh, the frustrations. Uh, so I think that is important. Of course, in this uh, uh, question of dialogue, uh, we must then, uh, as, as, as you said, include in the education and then the, in the education, the critical thinking, but also uh, social innovative thinking that was mentioned, but also uh, creative thinking uh, and uh, deep deconstructivist understanding must uh, be taught and must be prevailing because very often as i as i was uh, as as i was uh, uh, talking we can uh, end in our own ideological blindness and then we can disregard the one who are radically other than uh, that we are and because of that i think we can only also intro uh, introduce the, uh, the let, let's call it the the, the pluriperspectivity in, in the approaches. So, and this happened in our daily life, but this also happened in negotiation that, uh, that sometimes people uh, that are in a conflicting uh, uh, sides in one issue can establish a cooperation uh, into another so that it is not necessary that we uh, all uh, just divide ourselves into one, two or three conflicting camps. Uh, uh, our interest can change from, an as from one aspect to other. So it's very important that, uh, uh, that uh, in these uh, tensions, we should learn how to think uh, in a different approaches. And that is why to keep the world close and in cooperation. Well, I will stop here and leave more time for uh, questions and debate and discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Robert. And uh, it was really uh, very important, um, as you mentioned, that and, and encouraging, very honestly, encouraging uh, that we need to continue our, our efforts and our work uh, in this respect. And definitely, it will not be an easy and smooth way forward. Uh, we need to um, gen generate the necessary political will. Uh, we have to convince governments uh, as well. Uh, this is the, the key. But um, the, I do hope that uh, we shall have a, a nice ally uh, also in you, 
in in this uh, in, in these in these endeavors. Uh, and now uh, let me let me um, uh, give the uh, give the floor uh, to uh, Mr. Kai Agaide, uh, who is um, uh, a diplomat uh, and who is um, a very prominent representative of, of Norway. Uh, in diplomacy in the, in the international uh, field. Um, he used to be the UN Special Representative to Afghanistan uh, between 2008 and, and 10. He himself is a career diplomat. Uh, he's, uh, he, that time in, in uh, those years, he was head of the UN, UN Assistant Mission uh, in, in Afghanistan. Before that, in 2005, he was the UN Special Envoy to Kosovo. Uh, before that, uh, he was ambassador of Norway to NATO, uh, four years between 2002 and 2006. And uh, before that, he was the ambassador of Norway to OSCE uh, between 1998 and 2002. Uh, he was also the special representative of the UN, secretary general in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So he has rather big uh, knowledge uh, about the situation in the, in the, uh, in the Balkans. Uh, uh, and uh, he uh, was the state secretary in the office of the prime minister in uh, 1989 and uh, 90. Let me also mention that he was um, the representative as ambassador of uh, representative of Norway as ambassador at the international conference for the former Yugoslavia. Uh, but beyond this uh, uh, diplomatic career, he was also, he played an important and active role in national politics, and he used to be a member of the Norwegian, Norwegian parliament. Um, uh, Mr. Raide, dear Kai, please uh, take, uh, take, uh, take the floor, and uh, you as well will have uh, 15 minutes, and then we shall see how to, how to respond to the, to the possible, possible questions. Kai, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. <clears throat> thank you very much, and thank you to, to the previous speakers. Uh, it's been very interesting. Uh, you, you mentioned many jobs that I had, and uh, I try to keep my jobs for as short time as possible, because uh, when you do, then nobody has the time to understand how incompetent you are, you know? Uh, that's a secret that I recommend to others also. Although at NATO, I spent altogether 11 years in three different phases. Now I'm retired, uh, and um, I write, I speak, and try to give advice. Uh, first of all, I'm as a, like a question of dialogue and trying to get together. You know, sometimes I'm very optimistic, and that's when I look at my own society. Uh, in my own society, if I look back at my own youth, the youth of my daughters, and now see my grandchildren, uh, how the prejudices versus people of other ethnicities, other religions, other sexual priorities, preferences, etc. How that has almost disappeared. It's still there, but basically it's gone. We accept each other and, and as we are and we value each other as we are. And that's a tremendous progress. Uh, I know that my society is privileged in that respect. But it's something that I experience as shared by very many others also. <clears throat> so uh, there, there are positive things to, 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 to see. Um, and then when it comes to dialogue, I think, as I think Mila said, we, we're really in a, in a situation where uh, dialogue is in danger. You know, we're facing an uphill struggle. Um, uh, if I look back at the late 60s, early 70s, where I was a pioneer, I was among those who could sit down in the first East-West negotiations and try to bring uh, the NATO country, Warsaw Pact countries and other European countries together. And remarkably many agreements were concluded during the 70s and the 80s. We created a new kind of Europe. Hmm? It was a new international order. It was an order for a divided Europe, I admit, not for an undivided Europe, uh, which is today more or less the situation, but we made tremendous progress. Uh, why was that? It was because in the 1960s, some brave politicians decided that the situation had become too dangerous, too costly. It could not continue. We had to start talking. 
uh, and that's what provided the opportunities to reach all these agreements. So where are we today? We are in a situation where situation is even much more dangerous. Uh, the consequences will be much more costly uh, than in the 1970s if we do not manage to re-enter a situation and a period of dialogue. But alas, you know, it is far, it is looks today to be as far away as it can be. And it's it's partly I think it's it's a it's a lack of go of strong leaders, strong leaders in Europe, strong leaders in the United States, and it's also and, and elsewhere. And we are in a situation where also the global order is under transformation. So many countries do not accept anymore the US or Western led order. No, we see that in Brazil, we see it in South America, we you know South Africa, uh, so many other places. And we need to rethink where where we want the world to be to be to be heading. That's a huge, huge task. And in addition to that, you know, we uh, as we look for an international new international order, we're not only faced with the uh, conflicts between countries. We face with, I think, some of us from Mila mentioned, uh, and that has to do with technology. I mean, there are new technological challenges. There are forces that go beyond national borders and that makes, and that are so difficult to put into any kind of order. Um, let me just mention some globalization. We've seen how over the last year, globalization is perhaps not on the real on the retreat uh, as of yet, but we are at the tipping point. Uh, the digital uh, development tremendous. You know, I always used to say that the the the, the change for the transformation from the industrial area to the digital area is just as big as between the agricultural area and the industrial area, but we don't realize it. You know from day to day, uh, tremendous uh, challenges. And, and Mila, I think you mentioned the digitalization of society, uh, which will bring us so many benefits, but it also brings grave dangers, not only because it means, you know, we're in a situation where we, we can talk about the weaponization of everything. I, there's no doubt that, that uh, the digital, development makes it easier to develop advanced cyber weapons, uh, autonomous weapons, and also, I must say, lowers the threshold for a nuclear disaster. And that's really where we are. Uh, so it's, it's a serious situation. So why don't we then manage to get together? I'm encouraged to see over the last couple of weeks that the United States, that Washington, China, and Beijing are starting to talk also about artificial artificial intelligence. So things are happening, uh, but still not at a scale or far from at a scale that we really need. Um, and why is that? I think one of the reasons is short-termism, short-termism. There's so much happening that we, in our daily debate, tend to focus on the events of today or the events of yesterday or the events of tomorrow. And we do not manage to, and we focus on that and we don't manage to think of long term. There's something called the, the art of the long view. I think we've lost that, that kind of art, you know, being able to look back, draw experiences and lessons from what we've done, mistakes and good things, but also to look ahead in a more strategic fashion. That has almost disappeared, and it's also partly thanks to uh, to uh, social media that has also penetrated across the mainstream media, if you want. That makes it almost impossible to have a long term discussion about uh, about everything. So, what I want to see is, of course, a rebirth of an area of dialogue. But where do you start? Where do you start? I think. Um, your initiative certainly is is very laudable, very important. Uh, but then, how do we engage real polit top politicians in this? You know that has to be the the big challenge. I see today. I spoke to a couple of colleagues here. 
what about the Ukrainian war? Can we see any kind of situation emerging where the two parties both become so tired of it that a ceasefire is at least a, a short-term peace ceasefire is possible? No, we're not there. We're obviously not there. Uh, how do can we get to a peaceful solution at all? I doubt it at the moment. And then we have a year from now, perhaps a new American president, or and in the meantime, a very turbulent campaign that will suck all the political oxygen uh, in the from the debate, the political debate in the United States. Uh, so we're we're in a almost in a holding position, and we lack politicians that are able to lift us out of that. The same in the Middle East, I must say, very, very depressing. I read today uh, uh, some notes that I had from my participation in what was called the Mission Commission. It was created by by uh, by President Clinton and Kofi Annan to see if it was possible to stop the, the Intifada in 2000, 2001. Uh, and looking at the notes from there and seeing the situation today, we're in a much, much worse situation. And of course, the possibilities of re-establishing re a dialogue is, is much, uh, much more uh, difficult. I think we're also struggling, and again, partly because of social media uh, and the day-by-day -day debate, we're struggling with a situation where a broad debate where we listen, listen, and exchange views has almost gone. It's almost gone. We very, very, very quickly get into a very narrow band of opinions that are acceptable. And if you go outside that band, then you are, for instance, you're a, a Putin protagonist or 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 whatever. Uh, not protagonist, but I was looking for another word. Um, uh, Putin's reporter, let's say, uh, then, um, uh, uh, or whatever. And so I see people who really are people of dialogue in my own country who withdraw from the public debate because they cannot take the pressure anymore of not belonging to that main narrative that has been created. So how do we break out of that? That requires bold people and sustained effort and also media that are open to, to reflect uh, these things. So um, at the moment, I must say, I feel we're at a critical moment. You know, we always, or we very often use the word turning point. Are we at a turning point? You know, I, 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 to me, turning point means a situation where we as nations or as individuals or organizations can make a choice. We turn in this direction or in that direction. And we will disagree in which direction to go. But that's a turning point. I would say we're at a tipping point, not a turning point, but at a tipping point. And what does a tipping point mean? That is a point where you don't you you don't have any control. You don't have sufficient knowledge of the processes that you see, and the environment is climate is one of them. And you tend to see that tipping point only when it's behind you, when it's too late, hmm? and that's what we have to avoid. Uh, I think people are overwhelmed by the complexities of the situation. Hmm? Uh, they they simply don't want to participate anymore because they want they're willing to be to discuss one issue or another, but to be able to dis discuss that vast complexity, that puzzle where it is so difficult to see where the different bits and pieces belong, uh, that is simply too much. is overwhelming. I think that also contributes to the growth of the kind of populist uh, leaders that you see from most particularly of course in, in President Trump, uh, where so many Americans, so many Republicans say, we don't like what he's saying, but we support him because we believe that he stands for our interests. Hmm? We stand for our interests. And he's polarizing the American society to the extent that today more and more Republicans tend to marry other Republicans and not Democrats and vice versa. Hmm?
it's a remarkable situation. Um, how do we get out of that? It's going to be very, very hard. Um, but I think sustained effort, certainty, but we also have to find and identify politicians and we have to identify new alliances. And let me take one example. I've written an article uh, a few days ago where which has to do with the, the, the war in the Ukraine, where I say, look, we have to identify countries. First of all, I think it was a terrible mistake to just reject the Chinese peace initiative when it came. What we should have done was to go to Beijing and say, look, let's 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 have a look at this, you know, let's have a look, see what we can do about this. Maybe we can build on this, maybe we can work together. What we should do today is to go, for instance, to some of the BRICS countries, Brazil is one, uh, South Africa is another, etc., and see how can we build alliances that include the global south. Uh, and, and that can give us an opportunity to together um, mobilize the kind of support for peace and for dialogue that we need. I don't think we can manage in the West today without mobilizing also forces that, uh, that are today in a hedging position and where, where China on the one hand and, and the United States and I don't mention Russia here because Russia is not, I think, attractive to anybody. Uh, but where, where, where they compete for the hegemony, uh, for uh, not only regionally but globally, uh, and and let's see how can we bring them into a common effort. I think that would be that would be important as an as an instrument and as a contribution to to um, bringing us forward. Let me just look at my my notes here. Um, um, so so um, political leadership is certainly uh, important, and uh, and um, um, you mentioned Mila the the new technology that is available to all of us. The problem is that it's all. Is owned by huge American companies, multinationals, U.S. led, and are they really working for the benefit of all of us? No, they're not. They're working for their own profit, of course, as the market has always functioned. You know, we have to build the political counterweight and really get the discussion started on some of those important downsides of the modern technology. Only if we do that, can we make full use of it? If we don't make do it, then I think we will risk suffering from the backlash that the downsides of these phenomena can uh, can give us. I think um, I think I don't have much more to say at the, as a, as a um, at the start. Uh, but we certainly have a job nationally and internationally in bringing our societies together. Mm -hmm. uh, what scares me most is, of course, uh, the, the the climate uh, the climate crisis, uh, and to see the lack of awareness. And in my country, I think, strangely enough, it it's a country with quite a good education system. But there, I think there are no other Western country with the same level of uh, climate deniers as in this country. Hmm? How do you manage to create the awareness? It requires political courage. And you mentioned, uh, one of you mentioned 64 countries going to elections this year. Uh, what does that mean? It means 64 countries that will be focused on the short term agenda on how to win these elections with very little attention on how to do it beyond. Uh, that is, of course, uh, our task then. I must say I experience, uh, if not every day, at least every week, how difficult it is to reach out to public and convince them. Of where we are, you know, convince them of the dangers, convince them of the urgency. Um, but we have to continue, 
and we have to continue together. But I think it, it, in addition to building the broad alliances that you are doing, we have to also have to dive into the substance, and I'm sure you're doing it, and help each other develop the arguments and the approaches that uh, that are needed. Uh, one of you mentioned lessons learned. You will not believe how many lesson, lessons learned exercises I've been through in my life and how little we have learned from each of them. Because when, once we get to the next crisis, it seems that everything uh, belongs to the past and we have to start af afresh again, learning the same mistakes once, uh, once again. Um, conflicts, there have been a lot of them, I say. Of course, the, the the countries and the Balkans are close to my heart. I I love Montenegro. I love Macedonia. Uh, every time I go to to Montenegro, I go to the to the very famous monastery, the Ostrog Monastery, and also down to the coast to Sveti Stefan. I go to Lake Ohrid, uh, and also I must say I also spent uh, two weeks in in Puerto Rico. Which of course uh, um, is the country of the Nobel Peace Prize winner of 1987, I think it was. Um, so uh, we have a lot in common that we can work uh, work with, but it will be an uphill struggle, uh, certainly. Uh, let me stop there. Uh, I think I still have a five minutes left. But I will leave those minutes for the next uh, for the, the next session. All right, thank you very much. Uh, as usual, we run out of time. As usual, uh, I wanted to ask uh, the the audience whether does anybody have any questions? Uh, if uh, has, then please uh, just uh, raise your hands. And uh, firstly, let's give the priority to a uh, question to uh, Mr. Aide. Uh, or if you have a general question, then uh, he will probably be the first one who will have the possibility to, to respond to it. And then uh, we, we could continue. Okay, we do have some, some more minutes, uh, uh, maybe as an extra uh, for discussion and, and for responses. It was very useful. I don't know whether for the audience, uh, this uh, one and a half hour was more made more confusing picture or have cleared the picture about uh, the need, but uh, what I did understand is that uh, we, as an, as an alliance, we are pushed forward to do our, our utmost and we shall, we shall do it. So without uh, wasting time, please uh, raise your hands if somebody has a question uh, very, very shortly. If not, then I would give also the chance to the co-organizers, co Steinar and, and Harald, maybe you have one, one question to, uh, to anybody. Uh, or in the panel, or or to 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 Mr. Ambassador Guillemon, uh, <clears throat> please, the floor is yours, or the for the questioners. Okay, Steinar, please go ahead with your question. No, thank you to all of you. I guess my thought is, when I listen to you and when I look at a lot of the people that are also present in this uh, meeting uh, this afternoon there is will you know there is will to work for dialogue we also do have a pretty good understanding of the importance of dialogue we even have skills why is it that dialogue that let's say makes sense and particularly Today, when we see what's going on in Ukraine, we see what's going on in Gaza, it's almost some kind of a deadlock. It's to the point where I'm thinking, maybe the brutality of the wars right now can function as a wake-up call. Because we could have, with better diplomacy, with better dialogue, prevented some of these things, I assume, you know, can any of the speakers, any of the panelists, explain to me why dialogue is so weak in the international system when there are so many good humanistic arguments for why it should be taken more seriously? I would give the floor, first of all, to Kai, uh, Mr. Aida. He has to leave. 
And then I also think that Ambassador Guillermont uh, is uh, sitting <laughs> on the fire. Uh, so please, I will give them the floors and then uh, the, to, to the others, if you don't mind, colleagues. So, Mr. Aida. I still have half an hour, but uh, uh, so, so don't bother. But, uh, but I think um, there's one experience we must always take into account, and that is any solution to any conflict requires that the parties to the conflict really take ownership of that process. Hmm? And we've seen in most most places where where I've been, I must say, uh, that they do not. I think Colombia, where I have not participated, is one example uh, where the parties took ownership and managed to bring it forward, facilitated by others. Uh, if we look at uh, the Balkans, uh, Bosnia, for instance, there wasn't an ownership. There was no ownership. Had there been an ownership, the solution would have found, been found much earlier, and certainly before Srebrenica. Um, and I think today, in, if you look at uh, the Middle East, uh, they are not willing to take ownership because the, the distance between the positions is simply too big and there is no obvious, obvious readiness on any part to move from where they stand today. Huh? So, so I think ownership is really something that has to be fostered uh, and it's very hard. Uh, but to see that in the long term, a solution um, a peaceful solution is the way to go. Uh, is certainly one of the most uh, the most important tasks we have uh, to explain. And to explain that also, the, you know, I, I I I I think I've never seen a con um, uh, negotiations between become or start too early. Rather, I've seen it start much too late where the energy needed to bring forward a solution has become much, much more uh, demanding than it had been if we had started, if the parties had been willing to start before. I'm afraid of that today in in Ukraine and also other places. But then, let me add also that, uh, again, coming back to Mila, um, it is not only today about geographical or or wars. It's about a very important rivalry for global hegemony, which is very dangerous. I'm not so dangerous afraid of Taiwan, but I'm afraid of other elements in that hegemony that could really set the world back significantly. And I'm afraid of what is happening with, with regard to those global forces that we face today in a completely different way. And for that, we need to bring politicians to understand uh, the risks and not only be fascinated by the potential benefits. And it's much, it's much more fun, you know? It's much more fun to look at what it can bring of positive things, uh, gadgets or medical equipment or green energy, and then to be able to face and understand what the serious risks are. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Guillermet. Uh, if you do have any comments or any notes or, or something uh, to that, uh, uh, just I wanted to say also uh, to Kai that this is the idea to include politicians, and maybe Mr. Ambassador could also react to that. This is one of the most difficult things, you know, how to engage them and how to get them uh, to support the idea, because without them, uh, this this whole culture and concept uh, could not be promoted. This is my my personal view, of course. Uh, so, Mr. Ambassador, thank you, thank you, thank you, and, and um, thank you to Steina also for for the question. And and probably my sense is that uh, one of the elements why we have will uh, there is a need everybody is speaking how 
uh, the respect uh, of the international humanitarian law or the international human rights law is fundamental for the development and to well-being of the societies, there is an element of power that is playing, unfortunately, a, a big role, actually. And, and I think that the, the, this is, comes with the, the erosion of the multilateralism. And now what we are facing is that the, those conflicts are not necessarily share or ask the situation to all the countries. Costa Rica can make, raise the voice and say something, but actually all the solutions and what can be done but in Ukraine or in Gaza, is a decision or a conversation among, I, and I don't like this, this expression, but it's the themselves that they use, the, the key actors, the non-elect members of, of the Security Council, for instance, or even those who have a, a military power that they can say something and they have the right to be seat on the table. And the, the others, we are put on the side. This is uh, something for me is very important. And it's probably is something is, I, on my personal view, is a consequence of four years of Trump administration. During four years, the Trump administration decided to withdraw the United States for the multilateralists, to withdraw to have the role of uh, the champion of democracy, even though if we know that there is double standards and so so, but at least they were having this role at the international arena. And now I think that we are facing that. It means if it's like this, we need to be more engaged and uh, more active and um, looking for ways to have our work to say in, in on those discussions. And, and, and something, I think and I, this is an anecdote that I'm going to tell you. I was posted here since uh, September last year. The, 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 the Ukrainian war was ongoing. And I was surprised when I, I arrived here in Geneva, where it's a multilateral arena where you have the discussions and all my EU colleagues don't talk and they, I, they don't have the right, I don't know, but they don't talk to the Russian. Which is mean on my side, my, my as a diplomat, uh, uh, Mr. Aide, where I know him from a long time and I read a lot of his reports in the Security Council, knows we need to talk to everybody. And, 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 and this is the sense of this uh, uh, webinar, no? How we need to push for dialogue. But if one side, the EU, doesn't want to talk with his colleague and on, on, a, on a specific, I don't, I don't, I'm not asking or thinking that they're going to solve the situation here in Geneva. But there is a lot of things to do in Geneva. This is WIPO, this WHO, all the agencies, which is mean if, if Russia still being a, 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 a state uh, and they still be part of the International Telecommunications Union. There is a lot of things that are technical, the, the health organization, the ILO, which is mean we need to talk. And, and unfortunately, this is another thing that I find that, that, that we are taking reactions, you know, not with the, our strategic or with our mind, but more with our leave. <laughs> and this is not exactly what we need. And, and, there, um, and to end, um, I wanted to say something on prevention because as a chair of GAMA, it's so fundamental for me. And, and you, you talk about all the elements that we need for, for prevention, which is political will, uh, dialogue, a lot of dialogue and education. And you can have these three elements, then you, can, you will succeed on prevention. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for the invitation and also for this exciting discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I, I would like now to give the floor maybe to um, uh, Robert and, and Mila, if you want to add something and also ask the, the uh, participants, if does anybody have any question, just uh, raise your hands and then probably we shall interrupt the the colleagues uh, just to, to, to hear the question and maybe they can respond to it. Let's say so we uh, add one, eight more minutes 
to the to this hole and then finish it with that 20 20 minute delay but um, but please the floor is yours uh, mila robert please go ahead robert go ahead yes. robert and also I just, uh, george i just want to draw your attention to the fact that in the chat room yes. there have been wonderful discussion and wonderful questions but robert please oh, oh that's my problem okay okay thank you well thank you uh Stanard, for your uh, very sober and direct uh, question, of course, it's a big uh, challenge to, to answer it. But uh, I do believe that uh, uh, the dialogue is becoming very weak in the international scene uh, because, yes, I think that the, the cause was uh, given uh, just uh, in the first answer by Kai that we have a, a battle for the hegemony. Uh, and then we have a huge uh, security uh, fears. And then this uh, prioritization of security and the security fears is actually diminishing dialogue and democracy in, uh, in order to prevent security. So it happens that uh, the biggest problem happened when we are obsessed how to produce more security. And then the effect is counterproductive and absurd that we are actually doing more damage than what we would like to prevent for. And uh, uh, as, as I said, the, the, the democracy and the public opinion is uh, not uh, very prevailing when it comes to the question of uh, how state or how ma uh, 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 power centers are, are using uh, are using the violence and the using of power and then but then the, the problem is that uh, now uh, with uh, uh, with uh, this uh, uh, emerging crisis after the 7th of october uh, the world is uh, is uh, you know like uh, like uh, a, 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 a person which try to fill the gaps in the in the uh, in the dam in the uh, in the fleeing uh, water out of the of of the dam and then you don't know how many holes you need still to 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 block and you have only 10 uh, 10 fingers to do it so i think that uh, this kind of uh, flow has to stop and then then we need to rethink uh, before it is uh, too late. It might not be too late, uh, meaning that there might not be a global disaster, but now the suffering and huge atrocities are done on so many levels in so many different parts of the world. And then you don't need a massive uh, a machine to uh, induce a huge uh, damage. And because of that, uh, I do believe that uh, the 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 need for uh, action is very urgent thank you thank you very much i i steiner thank you so much for your question there's also i think uh, it was daria and i just want to make sure that we mention their names there's josh and daria that asked some very powerful questions and it will be nice to come back to that as well but steiner you said the dialogue is weak um, the dialogue is intentionally weakened. It's a strategy to separate us from each other and to stop, to obstruct and stop the dialogue. And you so poignantly said, we don't lack knowledge. And indeed, the world has the know-how for everything. We lose knowledge. We experience the loss of knowledge where we lack collaboration. Because guess what? You are not connecting collective intelligence. And then you're feeding all the collective intelligence and bioinformation and all the bio and cultural codes into what we deem or call artificial intelligence into processors. Guess what we get? Our own humanity facing ourselves in the mirror. And we are not afraid of the machine, for goodness sake, of course not. We're afraid of our own poor ethics disassociation, lack of empathy, not caring for each other, right? Not caring where everybody else uh, ends up or ends for that matter. So, and if we want to think in terms of um, where is the dialogue, look at the desperate need of people to communicate on social media to the point that they'll communicate about anything, anything and everything, what they're eating, 
what they're thinking, sleeping on, or, or, or fantasizing about. I mean, we are in desperate need to share ourselves with each other. So how does one to address um, partially Daria, who said something very powerful, and I'll respond to that. How do we reclaim collective intelligence? How do we reclaim collective intelligence? Because even financially speaking, all of the inventions, Facebook, GPS, artificial intelligence were publicly funded and taken, appropriated and taken away from the public and sold back to the public and centralized for vested interests. Got it. So how do we reclaim collective intelligence is by bonding and caring by what, what I'll call you by your names now in the spirit of camaraderie, because we're only humans, all else is epaulets or responsibilities that we have in the world. So as Christian was saying, Ambassador Christian was saying, Christian was saying, educate, educating the public. And yes, education is a long way process, but by the way we show up together today, by the way embody our values in the world, by every possible capacity that one has, we have to connect to people. We have to appeal to their universal humanity. We have to remind them that even if you're in a hotter, uh, heterogeneous community, you leave people alone, you leave them amongst themselves, guess what? Next thing you know, conflict erupts amongst themselves. Eliminate minorities, eliminate everybody else. By human nature, they go at each other because you have to have a common vision that pulls everybody towards empowered by rights, but actually responsibilities are pulling our, us forward towards common vision that says, listen, the quality of your life the quality of your well-being drops when you're not doing good, when we're not sharing good, we're not when we're not working for good. And that truth be told, I don't care what position you're, you're in. Politician in power, um, people in the street, we're all, all existentially exhausted and fed up. That's the truth. And by that, we need to appeal that, and we need to remind each other, we need to mobilize for peace. That's what Daria was mentioning. That's what Josh was saying. What does inclusivity mean when you're going towards one progressive agenda, but the others are in resentment, resisting? How do you appeal to universal humanity, to this sense of distaste, dissatisfaction, dis-ease, distortion, and, and depression. You appeal to that. You prod a little bit. Every human will want to share of themselves and say, so how can we do this? So we have to mobilize for peace. We have to be proactive. We have to educate the public on what is at stake, no matter what the majority chooses. And we go, even if we have to leave the earth. Um, and we have to stand for those values no matter what. Because it's a noble fight to fight. Um, it's a life well lived. And it is ultimately um, a way to show up for each other. Um, and probably lastly, um, reminding each other with tremendous faith that we were made for these times. <laughs> And we are here for a reason now, exactly at these times. So my invitation is to Harald now passing on the baton to speak. <laughs> and and I'm I'm sorry, Daria and 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 um, Kai mentioned that, and and um, Christian mentioned that. How can you disown Russia? <laughs> How can you? It's too dangerous. No matter what you think of Russian action or Russian, be careful, Russian government action. Disowning anybody is only going to cause more conflict. How we involve dialogue, that's exactly the art and, and the science and the art and the need that George is talking about. 
So Harold or whoever wants to go next. And thank you, thank you, thank you for all of you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, really, I do not want to mobilize, uh, to, to monopolize the, <laughs> the, the chat. And also, Josh, uh, Josh or, or, or Daria, if you do have any question, please just, you can raise it. Uh, Harald, I don't know whether do you want to say something very, very shortly because time is running out. So we, we, must, uh, we must end it, but definitely we shall have to organize another chat, another discussion, and then discuss uh, these sort of things uh, in, a, in a more flexible and less... Uh, 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 panel manner and, and just uh, in, in a sort of reflection. So, uh, Herat, please go ahead if you wish to. Or Josh, uh, I don't know, I don't see whether you want to say something or Daria, please interrupt then Herat. You are, you are then yes, uh, I'm, authorized. I'm, I'm always interrupted. I'm, I'm not, thanks for calling upon me. I'm not going to take a, a, even a minute. Any, anybody speaking about Mila will necessarily fail today. <laughs> Thanks so much for this uh, speech and, and thanks so much for this wonderful panel. I mean, we've been growing um, the, the narrative dialogue and dialogue association, and I'm going to be very happy and proud as a co-organizer to do so. And I'm particularly happy, Mila, about you pointing towards the, the importance of, of education at the same time saying that, of course, you know, education is, is a long-term process, both for individuals and for societies, and it will probably not help us uh, at any um, instant need of of a diplomatic order, yeah? but I think it is this is the only thought I can I can actually recur to is is education and more education, a profounder education towards dialogue. Uh, this will be my only my only statement, and and thanks to all of you uh, for for today. Okay, then <laughs> thank you, Harald, and uh, colleagues. Uh... Let me finish. We, we must finish. At, at a certain point of time, we must finish. Let me finish uh, with the promise that uh, we, shall, we shall invite you for another chat, maybe in another framework, in another context. Uh, thank you very much for the contribution, for the, for the inputs, uh, uh, and, uh, and for these encouraging uh, words. Uh, and I do hope that um, this was a step forward. Uh, in in many terms, and uh, I do hope that uh, we shall we shall meet uh, uh, maybe in another setup, uh, maybe in, in in the future, in the next future. For those who still have uh, stayed with us, uh, let me say that uh, the next step uh, will be that uh, we shall try to finalize this statement uh, on 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 institutionalization and on 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 alliance. And then uh, we shall try to start collecting signatures, collecting concrete supporters for the document, which then we shall uh, submit and we shall to the to to some UN uh, structures, to some uh, multilateral institutions, uh, and also definitely to the governments, and uh, as uh, also Kai suggested, to the high-level politicians uh, who who have a, a high responsibility that uh, dialogue will not be weakened but will be amplified uh, and this is this is our this is our task please don't ask me how to do that we shall have to think about that during the next nights uh, and next uh, next days and uh, thank you very much for the attention thank you very much for the panelists thank you very much thank you very much for the co-organizers uh, for your for your work and uh, and uh, I just want to warn you and threaten you that we shall meet each other very soon. Thank you very much. All the best to you.